With us is PhD in astrophysics, educator, science consultant for Star Trek, and writer of this episode, Dr. Aaron McDonald. Hi, I'm Dr. Aaron McDonald. I'm an astrophysicist and a science consultant for Star Trek. So I'm kind of a rocket scientist by day, warp drive expert by night. Aaron McDonald is not an astronaut. She's an astrophysicist that helps Hollywood make more realistic movies set in space. I try to make things like what you're seeing in the background or the dialogue as accurate as possible. And it's a dream job for me. <laughs> when it comes to marrying science with science fiction, Star Trek does it brilliantly for transporters. So fundamentally, I hate to break your hearts, but transporters will never be able to be a thing. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle states you can never know exactly where every particle is. So when we're transporting people, what you do is map where all of their particles are. And if you're talking about humans, you're gonna wanna go down to the really tiny subatomic level. Okay. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Dr. Aaron Explains the Universe. So this episode, we're gonna be exploring the idea of gravitational time dilation. Now this one, we're just gonna geek out about some sci-fi. So so I did my PhD in astrophysics. I studied space time and ripples from colliding black holes, which is objectively awesome. <laughs> and so we saw black holes collide from the ripples in space time that had traveled billions of light years to get to us. You know, eventually you get to the point where you wrap all of space and time around your ship, and that's you can think of as warp factor 10. And, some people don't want to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, that's when uh, terrible yeah. episodes happen. <laughs> we have a huge crowd here. This is awesome. Are you excited to learn a little bit about some science and a little bit about some science fiction? Yeah, yeah you are. All right. I help design um, satellites. I help the government try to figure out what they want to build and figure out if what is being built is correct. I work with writers. I talk about um, how to get the science right in their science fiction. If they want to come up with a warp bubble, how do they get to talk about it in a way that makes sense? I was a little redheaded girl who would sneak a VHS recording of X-Files episodes and watch them late at night. I was obsessed with every single thing that Dana Scully was. She was everything I wanted to be. I bought my first pantsuit when I was like 11 years old. I had a bobbed haircut, like way too young, ill-advised. For my 16th birthday, all I asked for was a really expensive trench coat <laughs> that I could look like Dana Scully. I still have that, by the way. Men and women in STEM were shown to be equally competent at their job. So it wasn't like, oh, the women don't know how to do it. it was, yeah. Right. That is interesting, because I think that when they do take the time to have female STEM characters, they aren't portrayed as incompetent. They, they are good at their job. And I do think, I think anecdotally, we're starting to see more, too, that there tends, there's starting to be more parity in the biology and medicine field than in the physics world. And I'm sure that that has something to do with it as yes. well. Yes. What do you think? Are you like Picard when he's talking to Rasmussen about the danger of using them for time travel? Are you afraid that you would be spaghettified? Or if we see something that looks like a wormhole, would you just jump in and see where you ended up? Let us know.